Welcome, everybody. We're going to wait just another minute or two for the folks who are still logging on. But feel free to use the chat feature and let us know where you're calling from. Hi, Jim in Meridianville. 
welcome. Mark in San Diego. I bet the weather's pretty nice on San Diego today. Chris in Ohio, Amber, Madison, Wisconsin. We have Michelle from Springfield, Missouri. We got folks from all over today. That's great. Baltimore, Maryland, Garland, Texas, Denver, Colorado. Wow. Arizona, California, lots of warmer states. Hope you're safe out there in California. We got Texas, Tulsa, more Texas, Kansas. Great. Florida. Minnesota. I'm from Chicago. I'm in Chicago too. Great. Welcome everybody. Well, let's get started. Welcome to today's webinar, Senior Living and COVID-19, A Candid Conversation. I'm your host, Janet Barker Evans. And you know, as we're entering the sixth month of the pandemic, many of us are focused on protecting our family and our loved ones, especially older adults. And today we're gonna to talk with a group of experts about how the coronavirus pandemic has cast a spotlight on senior living. So our candid, conversa our candid conversation will help to break down the realities of senior living during COVID-19 and beyond. We're going to talk about procedures and protocols in place to help residents and why you might want to consider senior living right now. Plus, we're going to answer your questions live at the end of the webinar today, too. So before we introduce you to our panelists, let's take a minute to talk about Zoom and how you can interact with us during the webinar. So things can be a little different from computer to computer or different devices. But if you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen where you're seeing this webinar, you'll see some icons. The one on the far left is usually a microphone. We've muted everyone's voice so there's no background sound, but I'll explain how you can ask some questions and ask for technical help. As far as the other buttons go, the most important one is the one that says Q&A and the one that says chat. When you click the Q&A button, a window will appear where you can type any questions you have for our Q&A session at the end. And we're gonna to get to as many questions as we can. The chat button opens a window where you can chat with the presenters and our moderator. If you're having any technical issues or problems, let us know in the chat. We've got moderators standing by to help you. You're also gonna get a follow-up email with all this information, as well as a recording of this webinar, so you can refer to it later or share it with your family or friends. Ready to go? All right, let's welcome our expert guests. First up, we have Joanne Carlin. Joanne is the Vice President of Clinical Risk Services at Willis Towers Watson. Joanne, tell us a little bit about your role and what you do for senior living. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the session today. Um, I'm a registered nurse and a licensed nursing home administrator and have worked for a long time, over 20 years in the senior living industry, um, initially as a leader over resident care and operations. And uh, the last seven years, I've worked for Willis Towers Watson, um, who is a large insurance brokerage, but in our company, we have a practice focused on senior living. And what I do and what I, my pleasure is in is wonderful. I get to help consult and work with senior living providers and help them identify opportunities for improvement and ways to reduce risk and exposure as they deliver care and services to the residents. That's great. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next up is Dr. Nana Lerman. She's an internal medicine and infectious disease doctor and the co-founder of the COVID Consultants. So Dr. Lerman, tell us about your work at COVID Consultants. Hi, thanks for having me today. So I'm an infectious disease physician. Like you said, I work in uh, Denver down at Rose Hospital. And uh, once the COVID-19 cases started slowing down in our hospital, uh, I decided to help our community and go into different businesses, helping them to responsibly reopen. That's great. Thank you for being here. Sure. Uh, finally, we have Kim Elliott. Kim is the Brookdale Senior Vice President of Clinical Services. Kim, tell us a little bit about your role at Brookdale. 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm a registered nurse and I have been uh, in, taking care of older adults for more than 26 years. So being at Brookdale has just been a privilege. And if you go, scroll to the next page, you'll kind of see an overview of what my role is. So um, if you think about all the nursing and all the clinical functions that occur in our communities, there's more than 700 community, communities in 44 states. Uh, 49,000 associates, 65,000 residents. So it is is definitely enough to keep us busy. And since we're talking about COVID today, I love the one uh, stat on the chart that's just showing that less than 1% is the total number of residents that are living in a Brookdale community that has had positive uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 test results. So that's something that we're, we're definitely very proud of. Well, that's great. That's great. So we're delighted to have all of you join us today. Let's start the discussion and we're going to begin talking about life during COVID-19. So Kim, let's start with you. How have you seen COVID-19 specifically impacting the older adult population? You know, first was just the impact to their safety and well-being. Um, with older adults having underlying chronic conditions, it, it's particularly difficult for them to recover from the virus. And you can imagine the fear and the anxiety that comes along with that potentially contracting the virus, um, knowing that it could be life-threatening. Uh, second would be that socialization component. You know, they've missed interaction with their friends and family and loneliness and isolation is real and that alone can have an impact on their health. Yeah. Joanne, how about you? What are you preparing or planning for as we head into the, um, the end of this year as it relates to COVID? Yeah, this is a topic that we're really uh, working on now. As you mentioned, we're well into over half the year of dealing with COVID. And fortunately, we've been able to put in some really good measures that are helping us contain and mitigate uh, the spread of the infection, the screening of staff and visitors, use of masks and face coverings, of course, the hand washing and disinfecting. Um, and even using testing to determine uh, whether employees and residents need to be quarantined. So these actions absolutely are going to be maintained throughout the year, but are also going to help us as we prepare for the flu season. Um, and that's something that we're all really happy with because we think it's going to reduce uh, some of the potential spread of influenza to our residents and, and the associates. I think the next big thing, and I know it's what we're working on now, is preparing for a vaccine distribution and administration once it's ready. Um, we know that the older adults are going to be prioritized as well as our staff. So we're trying to put together ideas and plans and process around the logistics of uh, getting the vaccine to our communities. That's great. So as we think about COVID, Dr. Lerman, what are things that older adults can do to reduce the risk of exposure and infection from COVID-19? Sure, I think that there are plenty of things to reduce that risk. Um, one is avoiding high risk behaviors and activities such as uh, crowds, indoor exercise facilities, singing in choirs, um, those areas in which you are, there's not great ventilation, you're inside, there are a lot of people, rallies, things of that nature. Um, those are one of the you know, higher risk activities. And then also um, interacting with family and, and you know, have, ensuring that family, if you have a, a college age grandchild coming to the house, that they understand that you know the, the older population is at, is at risk of severe disease from coronavirus. So they also have to, to understand uh, that and to be educated about those sorts of things. Yeah. And what types of things have you learned? So, so it's with COVID consultants, you're working in a lot of different, different areas. What have you learned from watching other industries respond to COVID, colleges or other communities that we might apply to senior living? Sure. Um, I mean, every industry is, is completely different. So you can extrapolate some things from different places. I think that establishing a testing strategy is important and realizing that no place is 
going to be guaranteed 100% coronavirus free and you have to plan for when it does happen. So as long as, you know, having a plan, having a strategy and having it be realistic is, is very important. So colleges, I mean, there are colleges that do all sorts of things, right? You can test people prior to coming onto campus and that's wonderful for right when they get there. But if you have no testing strategy or after that, then, you know, these are not people who stay in one place and do not move about. So it, it, all, de there's, it all depends on the specific institution um, and, and what it is that they are trying to accomplish um, from a testing, a testing strategy, I think is very important. And that's a lot of, uh, you know, what a lot of the schools have been trying to do and uh, different institutions in terms of, you know, sports teams and whatnot. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it's really impacted every part of our lives, hasn't it, right? And, and strategies is great. And speaking of strategies, um, that kind of cues up what we want to talk about next, and that is strategies for prevention and infection control. So, Kim, let's start with you. Prevention and management guidelines have been issued at the federal, state, and local levels, right? And it can be so confusing. So how are you balance these? How are you balancing all of these in responding to COVID? You know, that has been one of our big, biggest challenges. Because if you think about being in 45 states, you know, you've got all those different regulations coming at you. And just think about what it's been like just being an individual in your home during COVID-19. Because, you know, you don't wear a mask, wear a mask. Um, you know, it could live on services, clean everything that comes in your door. No, you don't have to clean everything that comes into your door. So just as our guidelines have changed, you can imagine what the communities have been through. So it's almost like we've had 45 sets of ever-changing guidelines that the communities have had to follow. Um, but some are very helpful because we've been able to learn some great practices in one state when maybe another state didn't have as tight of guidelines. So we've been able to identify best practices and it's been just um, very helpful. Um, and another complicating factor would be, um, you know, even if the CDC were to say something and said this is the guidelines, that local county health department has jurisdiction over that community. So they're the ones coming in to ask the question and making different recommendations. So you can imagine, there, there was just so many times when we were being told, you know, uh, so many different ways to do things. And uh, so just balancing that was, was definitely a challenge. And I can tell you it continues to be as we continue to learn more about the virus. Yeah. Yeah, things are certainly changing. It's hard, it's hard to know what to do, right? So yeah. Joanne, for you, how did you adapt with everything changing over the course of spring and summer, right? Can you give us an example, maybe of a policy or a decision that you're involved in that kind of evolved in response to all these changing guidelines? Yeah, and just as Kim mentioned, um, every, not only do you have the federal regulatory agencies, the federal government, then the CDC, but every state has their own uh, departments of health and licensing agencies for uh, communities that have assisted living or memory care, or even skilled nursing. So there is a lot to manage and our clients are in uh, at virtually every state. So what we did early on is to hold open forum calls with our providers, uh, those clients and even non-clients um, through other industry organizations, we came together to help clarify and identify concerns and and share solutions among ourselves so that we could keep on top of it, uh, leverage best practices, things that work, and ask questions of one another so that we could figure this out. And some of these topics included things like access to the community. Um, how were they screening staff and documenting that? Uh, what visitors were they restricting? And, and did they stop admissions? Um, and so those things that uh, we shared together and how to do that were put in place. And then it moved into the issue with PPE and the shortages. Since we weren't prioritized, um, how could we access PPE? And we shared resources for that. Um, and then our communities weren't designed to do respiratory isolation. So how are we going to do, do that? How are we gonna contain active COVID cases since they weren't 
allowed to be trans transported to hospitals. Um, and then staff training was another area where we focused in terms of respiratory isolation, training them on use of the N95 respirators and doing those fit tests. Um, and then how did we get staff to be able to come to work? Did they have childcare needs? Did they have um, other family members? And were they fearful of coming to work? So a lot of education and a lot of training and, and really being responsive to our staff. And, and put all that together, um, that was put in place quickly, rapidly, and we continue now to uh, be an open forum. We prepare webinars and training and individual consultation to share really what's working and what things can be done better. Not just through our company with our clients, but through uh, associations um, that are uh, for senior living and uh, we participate with them, as does uh, Kim and her team. You know, Joanne, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting point that Joanne brings that up. Just uh, something to add there. You know, it, it was very encouraging because it, everyone that's in this industry and taking care of older adults, you know, we were all in this together. And I know at Brookdale, we even, we had different videos. We put it on our public website. So when you have those assisted living communities of companies that only own one or two or three, they don't have the resources that, that we had. So how can we share and how can we all pitch in together to make sure that our residents are getting cared for in the best way? And, and I think, Joanne, that really just kind of highlights how the industry came together. Yeah. So Kim, if somebody was considering moving into a senior living center right now, what are some of the things, what, so what, what information should they be asking for and are there local resources that could be helpful for someone? Yeah, I mean, you would definitely want to um, be asking questions, you know, especially, you know, how have you enhanced your cleaning protocol since the pandemic? Um, you're going to want to know what their infection prevention and infection control protocols are. Um, your testing, you know, what is your testing process? How are you practicing social, everything from social distancing to mask requirements? And as far as those local resources, I mean, you, you can never um, say enough about just that local health department, but even the primary care physician or your, you know, family nurse practitioner to be able to say, you know, what are my risks and benefits of doing this? And, and is it an opportunity and will I be safe? So I think having those open conversations you can get to a point to where you're definitely comfortable with, wow, this, this really is safe. Yeah. And how do you think that the upcoming flu season could impact some of our senior living communities in this COVID world? So the flu season is, that's interesting because uh, there's a lot of speculation right now about that, the flu season. And, um, you know, there's the chance of them having co-infection of, of both. And the trickiest piece of it is they have the same symptoms. So there's going to be times whenever we're dealing with COVID or flu and in determining what we're dealing with. Um, the one thing I can say about it is I, there's, there's two things. The first thing I can say is that if there's ever a time that we are prepared and on guard and ready to do infection control and infection prevention, it's now. Um, our teams have been, you know, trained and retrained and, uh, the, you know, the competency level is so high in this area. So if there's ever a time that we can keep the infection out or the virus out, it's now. And then um, the second thing would be, you know, there is flu shots. And, you know, we don't have COVID shots, but there's flu shots. And I truly believe that anybody that is serving older adults, it's, it's our obligation to do everything we can. And, and we're really shooting for that 100% vaccination rate um, to make sure that we, you know, stay safe and don't bring that to our families, our residents, and we can really make a difference by getting our flu shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important. Dr. Lerma, do you have anything to add? Sure, I, I couldn't agree more with Kim there. I think it's critical now more than ever to have massive vaccination efforts for influenza. Um, I mean, not only, not only you know, can you have uh, co-infections with COVID-19 and influenza at the same time, but even if we don't have coronavirus, I mean, influenza is, is a killer and it is, it is critical to lessen the, the disease severity and decrease people's risk of getting the disease uh, overall. And I think that vaccination is the, is the way to do that. 
um, I think that healthcare providers uh, all over need to be vaccinated 100%, um, unless they have some medical contraindication to preventing them from doing that, which there aren't very many. Um, but I think that uh, you know, going into this right now, we are at, we are at an uptick in cases, and I think that we are starting to see the first cases of influenza coming out, and mm -hmm. could not stress more that vaccination and trying to get that 100% in all healthcare providers is, is, a, is a wonderful goal and I think very important. Yeah, we, we've heard the word twindemic, I think. Yes, I, I would love to try to avoid the twindemic. Um, and, you know, you would have to think that wearing masks and social distancing, washing hands is going to decrease the risk of influenza. They've seen that in, in other countries like Australia, their risks of influenza are down um, compared to last year, but also we are not Australians, right? We are Americans and we are not adhering to all the guidance uh, as readily as we would, public health experts would like to, to see. So um, I think the possibility of a twindemic is there, but again, I think that we should continue to wear masks, social distance, wash hands, and get vaccinated and to just to decrease that overall risk. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice for everyone. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about testing and testing policies. So um, when we think about testing, um, Kim and Dr. Lerman specifically, some of the symptoms of the flu and COVID are so similar, right? It makes it so hard to know the difference between the two. So let's talk about testing policies and the different types that are available for COVID. So maybe Dr. Lerman, could you briefly explain those differences between the types of COVID tests and what some of their pros and cons are? Sure, sure. So I think it's important to understand when you go to get a COVID test, what you're actually asking for uh, and what you actually need. So in terms of diagnosing active coronavirus, you think you have coronavirus or you were exposed to some of coronavirus is really one of two tests that you should be seeking out. And that's a PCR test, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. And that means that that test just amplifies the genetic material of the virus. Uh, or the other test that you can do to diagnose active COVID is an antigen test. And that test looks for viral proteins from, uh, viral proteins from coronavirus. Um, so if you have either of those uh, that are positive, that suggests that you have active coronavirus, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there's another test that you can do, but that's not to diagnose active coronavirus. That's to see if you've had it in the past, and that's an antibody test. That's a blood test. So again, that is not to be used to diagnose active COVID. To diagnose active COVID is the PCR test or the antigen test. Got it. And so, Kim, what kind of testing have we been doing at Brookdale, and how has that been handled? Sure. So we, we started out a couple months ago just with baseline testing. We wanted to know, even in communities where we had no signs and symptoms, we, we were worried about asymptomatic spread, especially among our uh, associates. So if, if they were coming in, is there any way we could, you know, do all this testing, catch it quick, you know, remove it from the community and prevent an outbreak? So in doing that, we embarked on this baseline testing strategy to where we did over 100,000 tests in a very short time. So, um, it, but it was very encouraging that, you know, there were many communities where we had none. And then there were a couple of situations to where we found, say, one associate tested positive where we were able to remove that associate. And then we were able to prevent the outbreak from anyone else in that community getting it. So that, that was great. Um, as far as the type of testing that we did, uh, we were doing PCR testing um, and, and going with the labs because we wanted that most accurate result since then, we're seeing different regulations and different requirements by states. And most recently, the federal government is shipping antigen tests to select communities. So what you're going to find is really a mixed bag there. Um, you know, we, we're doing anywhere from, um, you know, thousands of tests a week, but it really depends on the state, what they're, what they're requiring, um, you know, who's getting those kits, the expectations of those kits. But at the end of the day, anybody that is symptomatic, anybody, where if we suspect an outbreak, we will do 100% testing at that community and make sure that uh, we get on, on top of it as soon as possible. Another thing that we've done is um, we've started doing testing prior to move-in. 
So we have a confirmed negative test, uh, PCR test, on everyone before they move in. Great. And Dr. Lemon, you had mentioned some of these antibody tests too. Do, do we know if somebody is able to be reinfected or like what exactly those antibody tests tell us in, in comparison to what like the PCR and antigen tests tell us? Sure. So antibody tests can tell you if you had coronavirus before. And everyone's uh, antibody, the duration in which you have a positive antibody, how long your antibody lasts varies from person to person and varies uh, we think depending on disease severity. So there are some patients who have antibodies who last a few months, and there are some that are, are gone quicker than that. Um, and in terms of immunity and what, what does the antibody status really mean? If you, if you I think an anti a positive antibody can be helpful because it can show you, when I was really sick in March and I, and, and I couldn't get a coronavirus test, and I took an antibody blood test and it's positive, that means that, oh, that was probably coronavirus. And, and you can learn how your body handled it at that point in time. It doesn't mean that your body's going to handle it the same every time, um, but it means that that's what your body, um, how, that's, your, that's how your, your body responded to it at that time. So I think it's a helpful data point. In terms of immunity, Oh, there's still a lot we need to learn about that. So I really caution people when they go to get an antibody test, if they do get a positive result, it does not mean that they are immune. It does not mean that they don't have to wear a mask or social distance or wash their hands. It is really just a, a data point um, that shows you that you had coronavirus at some point. Got it. So it's not necessarily clear, right? We don't know that yet. Right. So. And in so, terms of reinfection, there have been a, a few case reports of reinfection. And the way that you can document that is you have to sequence the virus. You have to do genetic testing on the virus the first time you get it and the second time you get it mm -hmm. to confirm that that uh, is a reinfection. And that doesn't happen very often, right? Um, there are millions of coronavirus tests going on and there's no viral sequencing. Uh, to, to trace whether or not those are new infections or reinfections. But there have been reinfections documented. And from what I have read in there, there was one actually in the United States. Um, and one, the first one actually, I think was in a 33 year old man in Hong Kong. And he got reinfected, I wanna say it was five months later. Don't quote me, but I think it was. And they were able to sequence the virus before the first time and the second time. And they, and in his particular case, he had a much more mild illness um, of coronavirus. So we don't know, is that what most people are gonna experience? It's hard to say, I mean, cause it's, they're just anecdotal stories at this point. Yeah. But reinfection is possible. Right, so, so Dr. Lerman, then if, if someone's considering moving into a senior living um, facility, then how important is it for them to kind of consider and understand the testing policy, what kinds of questions should they be asking before they move in? I think before they're moving in, I think it's important to establish, is there a testing policy? Because not every place has one. So, and what is that policy? Do I get tested when I move in and then there's, there's no strategy after that? Or is there periodic testing? Is it random sampling? Is it every Monday I should expect a test? It's also, what is that test exactly? Is it a PCR test or is it an antigen test? Um, because they're different. And is it, um, is it a test that I spit into a cup? Or is it a test where something goes and tickles my brain? Or is, you know, there's various things that you can ask about these uh, testing strategies. And also, what happens if I have no symptoms and my test is positive? Is there a confirmatory test that happens after that? Or do I just get put into isolation and I stay there for 10 days? You know, what does that all look like? And, and what does that look like for me if I do have coronavirus and I am in a facility? Um, can I, is there a way that I can see my family? Is there, am I, in a, am I in a room with a window where I can look out to a courtyard? And what, what does that all look like? Yeah, Kim, anything that you can add to that as well? Yes, the only thing I would add is just, you know, it, it really still depends on that state. Um, you're going to see some wide variances. So, if say you lived on a state line, you may go into one community and they say, oh, we're testing, you know, every single week on Tuesdays and we do this. And the other saying, we test associates only. 
uh, only test residents when they're symptomatic. So you're, you're just, you're really going to see a difference. So it may be interesting to say, you know, what, what is your requirement by your regulation? Um, because number one, you're going to hold them to that. But then again, is there times when um, you need to go above and beyond? And, and I can tell you that we do a lot of that. Um, we go above and beyond what the state's asking us to do. Yeah. So as we've done talking about t testing, it, a lot of this is overwhelming, right? And if we think about, you know, Dr. Lerman, you were just talking about, can you see your family, right? There's all of this isolation that, that quarantine is causing. So let's talk a little bit about the mental health toll, right? This can be really stressful for older adults. It's stressful for all of us, but especially older adults that causes loneliness and increased stress and anxiety. So we know that that's been happening. So Joanne, let me ask you, how much did you weigh isolation and mental health, especially as this pandemic kind of extended out like to five and six months? How, how did that weigh in on a lot of what you've been doing? Yeah, that's really important. And when you think about a lot of decisions to move into senior living are based on socialization and the programming and the ability to be with others, uh, kind of like peers, as well as, um, you know, have opportunities to do things and see things that you can't normally do if you were living on your own. So, of course, the first response to the outbreak is the immediate concern for uh, life and well-being. And we knew we had to lock down and, and quarantine and figure out how to prevent the spread of, of the illness. But quickly, we started thinking about this issue of isolation, emotional and psychosocial aspects. Um, some of the good things, uh, thank goodness that COVID happened at an age where technology is so prevalent and um, we can have virtual connections. And I think a lot of that uh, is happening. Uh, we started that as soon as we could, the FaceTime, the Zoom calls, all of, all of what we're doing now. Um, and then um, I have to tell you, senior living, and a lot of folks may not know this, but the the individuals that help our residents have a really fulfilled life. Um, they're called lifestyle or activity uh, directors that really wake up every day and think, how can we uh, help individuals have meaningful experiences? And so every community started really trying to get creative and innovative and try things to help residents uh, engage with one another. Of course, using the masks and social distancing and um, disinfecting the high-touched areas or spaces that were used over and over, um, bringing folks outside to have interactions and uh, get fresh air and air circulation was another good innovative way to be together um, in uh, for the residents living in the communities, but also when they had visitors and others that they wanted to spend time with throughout the day. Yeah, so staying safe <laughs> and creative with how we make sure people can stay connected. Yeah. Kim, when people are living with Alzheimer's or dementia, have they been affected by this pandemic a little bit differently? Uh, absolutely. It, it, it's been a huge difference in our, our typical average resident compared to those that have Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, research is saying right now in, in looking at, you know, studies that is there a genetic link that when an Alzheimer's patient contracts um, coronavirus, is it more ex um, extensive? I mean, do they have a harder time getting over it when they have that uh, diagnosis? So there's still a lot of studies out there and a lot of speculation, but we've seen that area hit very hard. Um, one of the things is if you think about the Alzheimer's or the uh, demented resident is they don't understand the importance of social distancing or wearing a mask or washing their hands. So you can imagine just the different things that our teams have had to do to get them really, really you know, interested in, in making sure that they're following those protocols. And we even had, you know, some new people that have, have moved in 
And, you know, they may be able to practice social distancing and wearing their mask, but it doesn't mean the person next to them is going to, to keep that space. So it's not only just them, it's, it's, it's everyone. So um, it's just been really important for us to have specific protocols. Um, we've, ha we've used an additional, um, uh, Sarah works, it's a, a barrier foam that we've used on all of our um, residents. We've done things like, um, you know, typically they love to get their nails done or they love hand massages. So how do we do that with hand sanitizer lotion? Or, you know, to where we can still make sure that they're getting what they need, but yet it doesn't come across as we're asking them to do something they don't want to do. So it's been carefully balanced in, in that population. And one other thing I'll mention is their symptoms are different. We've had different symptoms to where they can't complain about the loss of taste or smell or, or that type of symptom um, or complain of shortness of breath. But what we've seen is um, their level of functioning completely changes. It's like they may have been able to always feed themselves breakfast, and then all of a sudden they, they cannot pick up the spoon and, and feed themselves breakfast. So, so we really watch for those changes in behaviors too. So um, it's been an art to uh, to master that, and, and we've had a great team that has you know took on the challenge and did a great job. Yeah, there's a lot of different things to consider with different different folks and what their needs are. So, um, you know, with us going into winter, Dr. Lerman. Um, how do we manage and how can people manage that emotional loneliness, that cabin fever? It's getting into colder months. We can't go outside. So it's going to be more difficult. What are some things people can do to kind of manage through some of that? So I live in Colorado and <laughs> we get snow and it gets You've cold. already had snow. <laughs> and I, and I, right. And I want to stress, even though it is cold, I think it's still important to go outside. I think you put on your boots, you put on your gloves, you know, it, it's fun. It, it, it's fun. And as long as you can physically tolerate, I'm not saying go out there in a tank top, but I think it's important to still go outside. Um, and in terms of staying in touch with people and, and not, ha uh, you know, being a victim of cabin fever and whatnot, I think that as trying to be uh, as tech savvy in this time as possible, it can only serve you well because while I struggle with just the basic Zoom, I cannot even turn on my remote control TV at home. My husband has to do it. I do not like any of that. But I think in helping our elderly community and our, uh, our older generation, I think it's important to uh, have devices that are readily available to them that are easy to navigate. So I am a fan and I have no uh, financial ties to uh, Echo Show. But Echo Show is an amazing device where you can literally, someone can just call you, you push one button and there they are. And it's like, and it's a screen, like a, a like an iPad size screen and they're, they're there with you. And I, you can just have that on all the time. And if you, you know, if you have a family member who's um, in, a, in a facility or in a, in a place where, you know, you can't see them all the time or they're in some sort of isolation. I think it's really an important tool to have to be able to, you can see them, they can talk to you. I mean, it's, it's a very user-friendly device. And I can, so I can only say that that I think is wonderful, but I also think it's really important to like what Kim was saying, you, I mean, you really, you have to kind of get creative and you have to, you have to get creative. You really have to um, think outside the box right now because you know, COVID is outside the box. COVID fits no box yeah. that we've ever seen in every part of it. That's yeah. right. You know, for technology, last month, we had a great webinar on staying connected through technology. It talked about the Echo Show. It talked about Facebook portals, talked about all the different devices and like tools and training for, for older folks that, or even people that aren't that tech savvy, Dr. Lerman, you might want to check it out. And with some experts that talked about it, so go check out August's webinar we did on technology. It walks through all that, and you're right, it's such a great way to use technology to stay connected. Um, and, and Joanne even said, it's a great time for this to happen. We have technology to help us, so. Um, right. so people and it's only gonna get better, because all of these companies are, you know, that this is, this is a whole new, I mean, the, the entrepreneurial playing field has just been leveled. 
And so people are now trying to think of ways to, I mean, a lot of people lost their businesses and, and lost their livelihood and are now pivoting to try to make something new and create something that people want. And that is a huge, this is going to be the huge industry where you're probably going to have, I don't know if you've ever seen the, um, the exercise. I don't have it, but I've seen it all the time. It comes up on my Instagram, the mirror, the mirror exercise. Have you ever seen that where you, um, they're going to have that soon enough. It's going to be, you can connect a whole lot live person. You could see their whole body. So, I mean, it's just the echo show times, you know, a, a live in, in full form there. Yeah. So it's only going to get better. Yeah, I agree. It's exciting that, that part anyway. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Lumber, one more point. So, you know, people like doctors and, and caretakers and people that are helping in our senior communities, right? These are essential workers. Can you talk a little bit about how caregivers and like the mental health toll that's that this is kind of taking on our essential workers? Sure. I think it's it's a very important thing to talk about and take note of that uh, there is some PTSD happening and in, in certain places and in a lot of places they haven't had to deal with a COVID outbreak, but in certain places they have and it's been uh, like a war zone for them. And I think it's very important for employers to be aware of that and to check it. It's not just checking in on the residents. It's the, without the staff there, there's no residents, right? It's not gonna function. So if your staff is suffering, um, and it's not always easy to see, they're not always gonna come out and say it. So it's very important to check in on their mental health also. Yeah. So Kim, do you think that um, as we think about um, combating loneliness and depression during all of this, do you think that senior living communities can be an effective option for that and kind of help people come back some of that? Absolutely. You know, we, we saw that before COVID, um, that there would be many times when residents would be, they'd be isolated in their homes. Family come by on Sundays to see them, but besides that, you know, they would be there. They wouldn't have that interaction. And when they did move in, they made friends and then they had a social life and uh, they just completely turned around in, in, in the way that um, just their health and well-being. And so with COVID, um, we, we've seen it again because they are even more isolated because the family do, does not want to stop by because, well, I went to the grocery store, so I don't want to go by and see mom because if I do, what if I take something to her? I would feel guilty. So there's even less of that. So, I mean, that is a you know, really serious concern. Uh, we've also seen residents that were living with an adult daughter or son. So when they came to move in, they may have had that interaction because kids were coming in and out and playing and stuff, but they still miss that interaction when it's not people the same age and, and they don't have as much in common with or don't have the same, you know, either complaints or thoughts or, um, and then there's also an increased risk with COVID of kids coming in, you know, and out of the house. So we do think that that has been um, a very effective strategy during COVID. And as you know, some people have thought, ooh, I don't wanna take them there. It's communal living, it's dangerous. We're not gonna do that. The people that have gotten their heads around it and asked the right questions and felt that comfort level later came back and said, you know what, you were right. I'm so glad because I think another couple of months, I think the depression would have been, you know, 10 times worse, especially getting into the winter months when they can't go outside. Yeah, that's a good point. So thank you guys for the discussion on mental health. We're going to take a quick Zoom poll. We're going to end this section with a quick poll on how all of you in our audience are dealing with COVID-19. So on your screen, you should see a poll pop up. It might take a minute. There's nothing you have to do till the poll opens up. But when it opens up, you see a question there, right? And we invite you to read that question and then answer with how you feel about that. And when you're done, click, um, click, the, click the submit with our little poll. You were asking how it's affected your own mental health, happiness. So answer that. All right. So thank you guys for your input. Um, our last section, we're gonna talk a little bit about choosing a senior living community during COVID, right? This is our new reality. And so, Joanne, I'd like to start with you. So knowing what we know about COVID, all the things we've talked about, <coughs> would you recommend, oh, here, sharing the results. Sharing the results. How has COVID-19 affected your mental health? 
most people say slightly worse mental health. Well, slightly worse is good, better than significantly, but I think we're all feeling that. So thank you for that. I hope you guys can see all that. Um, so I'm sorry. So Joanne, would you recommend moving to a senior living community right now, given everything we know? Yes. And, and let me just sort of reflect on a couple of things. One is that when we talked about um, the residents having to be isolated or quarantined, realized that there were still staff members coming and going in, in their rooms. And when a resident moves into a senior living community, the community becomes an extension of their family. The staff become more like family to them. And honestly, that's why some of the staff have reacted to um, the stress of seeing what the residents are going through. Uh, even if they're not sick, they, they hate to see the residents not have the robust, fulfilled life that they were having pre-COVID. Um, but when you think about what senior living did when this first started, um, they have been working tireless, tirelessly. And in even now, I talk to them about be careful, COVID fatigue can set in. We, you know, we still have to be vigilant and everyone is and they're aware of that. Um, but everything they did to help keep residents safe and provide care initially and in it, to some degree, we still have some chaotic topics and moments, but they tried to put uh, solutions in place quickly, spent millions of dollars in, in PPE and testing and disinfecting and all of the environmental uh, controls that they could. And they're doing all of this with the needs of the residents in mind. And you have to remember that a really a good senior living community is always making decisions based on what's best for the residents. Yeah, it's great. Kim, are there other precautions that that Brookdale's taking right now to help minimize risk for new people that are that are moving in? As I mentioned earlier, you know, we do have that new pre-move-in testing strategy um, that, we're, that we're doing. We, we, do, we test with a PCR test three days prior to move-in. And before they move-in, we make sure that we have a negative um, response. And, and if that individual is high risk and we, and we feel like we need a second negative, we'll go ahead and do a second negative uh, between day four and seven. So um, that, that's just important because if, if you're... If you're in a in a community, you don't want someone that maybe has been out in in the general public and maybe even careless or or making mistakes, you know, kind of come in and then and then bring that inside of our community. Um, but besides that, you know, I think that what is so important right now is just everything new that's coming out. You know, the one thing that we have not done is set our policies, you know, back in March and April, and it's been set. We are constantly looking at what is the newest from, um, you know, cleaning products to air purifiers to, I mean, there's, there's so many things there to different products to how can we enhance this? So we have been able to make multiple changes, even with PPE, you know, getting a, a higher quality. At first, it was whatever PPE we could grab. You know, we've got to get these masks. Well, let's get these. Now it's like, okay, we've got a choice of three masks. We're going to get the one that does the highest level of protection. So um, just constantly improving our process and then watching uh, what's going on. We've reached outside of CDC and actually looked at international studies. We've looked at what China did with any kind of um, communal living. And then, um, you know, how do we take lessons learned and then apply them to our Brookdale communities? That's great. Thank you. So now it is time for us to hear from all of you that are watching this webinar today. We welcome your questions for Joanne, for Dr. Lerman, for Kim. And to ask your question, look for the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When you click it, it's gonna pop open a window and just type your question in and click send. I'm gonna see your questions and I'm gonna address them to the different speakers and have them respond. We'll get to as many as we can. And don't worry, like I said, you are all gonna get a follow-up email with all this information. You're gonna get a recording of this webinar so you can refer to it later and you can also share it with your friends and loved ones. So let's hop over to the Q&A and see. Okay, what do we have here? Okay. You mentioned the probability of a vaccine. 
Will available vaccination be required of Brookdale residents? And what will be um, the issues if there's a resident that doesn't want to get vaccinated? Any thoughts on that, Kim? Uh, sure. So, you know, there's a lot of unknowns about the vaccine uh, as far as when it's going to be here, what the indications of use are going to be. Um, so uh, it's, it's kind of hard to answer that. We, it's, it's never a, whether it's a flu or whether it's COVID, it's not that you are mandated to get it. That's never the policy. What we'll do is we'll talk about it. What are the risks or the benefits and make sure that you're making an informed decision that's best for you. Um, if, you, if you're not interested in it, a lot of times we'll say, you know, have you talked to your physician about it? And if that conversation has happened, then, um, you know, we would, we would let it go at that point. So it would, it would never be mandatory. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question. Um, with the sequencing test, would the expectation be a different sequence noted for the first infection versus a reinfection? And Dr. Lerman, I think that was for you. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, sure. I, I just, I didn't understand the question. Can you just read that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. With the sequencing test, would the expectation be that a different sequence noted for first infection versus reinfection? So this is when you were talking about the sequence yes. of testing. Sure, sure. So when, to establish that there are two different uh, infections, you'd ha they'd have to be sequenced and they'd have to be different. Does that clarify? I think so, yes. That made sense to me. Okay. Is there any kind of visiting with residents living in Brookdale communities possible? Right? I'm wondering what to anticipate for the upcoming holiday and what I might be able to do to help my mom celebrate the holiday in a way that's meaningful to her. Yeah. So that is a Oh, I was just going to start answering that. That's a very good question, and I, I wish I could give you a very good answer. What we're seeing, and, and actually I just saw something come out from the state of Texas today, so I don't know what state you're in, but we are opening our communities based on what the states are allowing us to do. So if a state comes out and says you can have two visitors per day or, you know, what, whatever the requirements are, we find a way and we build a process to work around what's the safest way to let that happen. So if you're in a state where um, there's restrictions, then, you know, hopefully what they're paying attention to is the average number of cases in that county. And once they see that those counties lighten up and they kind of get to where they want them to be as far as like less than a 10% infection rate, you, we typically see them um, open up. So I hope um, and pray that you can spend Thanksgiving and the holidays uh, with your families and have that opportunity. And um, if, if something happened and that's not the case because of cases or because of the state um, regulations, we're going to we'll do everything we possibly can to make sure that, you know, we use technology to uh, get them in front of you so that you can spend time together. And Kim, when we have new residents, there's a question about procedures for new residents. And when people move in, are they put into quarantine and isolated or how are we handling that when new folks move in? Right. Um, no, generally the answer is to no to that. Um, there are a few exceptions. We have some states that require it um, that will not let anyone come in without the 14 day quarantine. But as a Brookdale policy, what we do is we do that testing prior to. Um, we started doing that, I would say about um, six weeks ago, because originally we were quarantining, um, you know, while we were still learning the virus and, and how to, to manage it. Um, but we test three days prior to move in. And then if we get that negative test, then um, we, and they're not symptomatic, they pass all the symptom checks, they haven't been around anyone who's so been COVID, there's a series of, of questions that you have to go through, then you're not. Um, if you're high risk, so say, uh, yes, I went to church last week and no, we didn't wear a mask, then it will be a situation to where you're considered high risk according to our screening. And then what you would be asked to do is you'd be asked to, to stay in your room until you can get a second test done on day four to seven and until we get that second negative back. Um, the only exception to that is the state. And then the other one is memory care. Because memory care, we automatically do two tests just because of the risk. Yeah, I understand that. And how about community visitors? Do they have to be tested prior to visiting? 
they do not know. They have to go through the symptom check, the temperature screening, and as long as they go um, past that, and if it's allowed by the state, then that visitor is allowed in without a test. We do, um, of course, with the social distancing, you know, we did a lot of outdoor visits. We did a lot of, you know, set up in an area to where that's the most important thing is keeping that six feet um, space in between them um, and in addition to wearing their mask. Great. And then let's see, we're looking at some of these um, similar questions. If um, there's somebody that's asking they want to move their, their mother from one room to another within the same community, they wear a mask and all that, they want to set up a different room, and they're asking if that's possible. And I'm guessing that may be a local issue that they have to talk to someone locally. Yeah, it would be a local decision, but I mean, there's no reason as far as like a policy that would not allow that to happen with the, with the proper cleaning techniques. I mean, we, we can move rooms without any problem. And Dr. Lerman, a question for you. Has telemedicine changed the game for seniors in general and older folks during COVID-19? I think that's a tough question, but it all depends on, I think it, it, definitely can have a positive impact as long as the senior is able to access the computer and and get onto a telemedicine chat with it with a with a physician so it all depends on your ability to be tech savvy and and to and to initiate that and make that happen but if you're in a place where someone could help with with that procedure i think it is is a wonderful um avenue and access to care when it's otherwise not possible and, and uh, I'll just add on to that. I think for senior living communities, this has been a huge benefit to me. This is part of that good that this happened now with all the technology. Um, the communities, especially assisted living memory care, are able to facilitate those telehealth um, interactions and get residents not only routine care, but get them evaluated for urgent situations uh, without having to send them to an emergency room where they might even get exposed to COVID there. So um, it's, it's really been, a, I think, a godsend for the communities to be able to have more access to telehealth. And um, the senior living providers are setting up systems and processes for telehealth to be a permanent part of uh, how we help take care of residents. Mm -hmm. You know, Joanne, another question you might be the right one to answer is somebody is asking why different facilities have different rules and protocols and they're asking, aren't they all governed by the same agency? So why do they have different rules at different places? Yeah, now you'll really appreciate uh, Kim and what she goes through with uh, helping to figure all of it out. Um, in For federal regulations, the only federal regulations uh, that help with senior living is skilled nursing. And so when we talk about senior living, we're talking about independent living, we're talking about assisted living, memory care, and we include skilled nursing into that. Well, for assisted living and memory care, every state has their own regulations and no two states are alike. They have some similarities, but we have to make sure we're addressing each of them. And in some states, there are even regulations that spill over into independent living. Um, if, for example, California, if you live in a what's called a continuing care retirement community, the regulations for assisted living are also applied in independent living. So it's a complex uh, regulatory issue. And uh, yet I think uh, what we look for is what are the common practices that help not only provide the services and the care and the programming that residents expect, but how can we best comply with the regulations? And I will say in the case of Brookdale, they do a lot of um, looking at the regulations and standardize on really some uh, best practices and some of the more stringent requirements. And I'll let Kim speak to that, but uh, being on operating in 44 states is no small task. 
The only thing I would add to that is is also the the nuance between if a, if the county health department is providing guidelines, so if they have maybe had an outbreak and they're really monitoring it, they may have told them for the next 14 days, we recommend you do this, this, and this. So just because the state's saying one thing, a community may have been told something different by a county health department. Yeah, and, and a big challenge that we saw, especially early on, was some of the departments of health didn't realize the difference between assisted living and memory care, even though it's licensed under the same licensure. So uh, quite frankly, the senior living providers had to educate some of the departments of health uh, so that they understood the population that we were serving. Yeah. So we are coming up on our time. It went fast, it went fast as it always does. And Joanne, Dr. Lerman and Kim, I sincerely want to thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you all who joined us and asking your questions. We're going to email you all a recording and transcript of the webinar. Again, you can view it, share it with your friends and family. And we ask that you join us on October 23rd for our next webinar, Senior Happiness in 2020, to learn about combating loneliness, improving mood, staying connected during COVID. We'll be getting into fall and into the winter time. So we're going to discuss senior happiness, how we can use it, to approach all these challenges that are unique to 2020. And we're also going to talk about what we're specifically doing in our communities to help our residents stay upbeat and engaged. So our webinars feature a different subject, a different subject every single month. And we hope we see you again soon. So until then, we hope you stay safe, happy, and well. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.